I'm really pumped about this one today. We're going to be talking with Dr. Dante Finelio, and he is part of a team of scientists that are out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico right now studying deep water fish. And we're going to hook up via satellite, and he's going to tell us a little bit about what's going on out there. So you don't want to miss this one. All right. So today we're joined by Dante Finelio. Dante is the Vice President of Conservation and Research at the San Antonio Zoo. And he is always doing something really cool. And right now he is out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. And he is looking at some deep water animals. I don't want to say fish because there's a lot of different animals down there. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on with that, what the research he's doing is, and of course, why it's so important. And I want everybody to stick around at the very end because I've got a very important message for you about the conservation work that he's doing. So Dante, when we think of uh, fish, most people think of the, the coral reefs. And where you've got a, a mass congregation of all these different animals that live together, it's like a big city. There's a lot going on. You've got uh, apartments, you've got high rises, you've got good guys, bad guys, beggars, thieves, all of these different things going on in a, uh, in a coral reef. But that's not where you are. You're out in the deeper area, out in the uh, far depths of the Gulf of Mexico, and you're looking at animals that are found in the deep waters. So if you could tell us a little bit about what's going on, what your research is, why you're there, and then I understand you've got a couple of animals to show us as well. I sure do. So um, it's, I'm very fortunate to be part of the Deep End Restore Consortium. It's a group of scientists from uh, a wide variety of institutions looking at the impact of oil spills on the pelagic fauna of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, what we're trying to do is assess the, the, the impact from something like the deep water horizon oil spill on all the wildlife that lives in the water column. We're not looking at things that live on the seafloor, just things that live in the water column. And most people don't realize just how deep the Gulf of Mexico gets, but, but it, it has some considerable depths. Uh, we're using a specialized piece of equipment out here called a mock nest system. It's basically a unit that has uh, six nets uh, within one system. Everything is computerized so that we can send the system down to a discrete depth. We can open the mouth of the net. We can fish at that depth for a certain uh, period of time, shut the mouth of the net, and then pull the net up to a different uh, depth and, and, and repeat the process. It's really important that we understand where the specimens come from with regard to depth. Uh, we want to know the, how the abundances of these species are uh, relative to points in the past, maybe even pre-oil spill. And we want to be able to, to decipher where something came from when we're looking at its tissues and we're looking for contaminants within the tissues. So discrete depth uh, collecting methods are really, really important. And, and we do that here from the ship. We have a specialist actually on board that manages that system for us and does a really good job. That's pretty cool. That's some pretty high tech stuff going on there. And, uh, and yeah, I think, you know, some of the animals that I've worked at is, you know, it's location, location, location. So yeah, definitely at the depths and what they're doing there at the depths uh, that, that you're finding them is, yeah, that's, that's really important stuff. And I think it's important for those who aren't familiar with the, uh, the accident that happened with the Deepwater Horizon is that it was a, a very deep oil spill. It wasn't like a tanker that ran aground and, and spilled things at the surface and it's affecting uh, waterfowl and otters and, and some of the fish there. This was a, a very deep event that happened that, that is affecting, as you said, all of the different trophic levels, all of the water columns. Um, so it's, it's very important that, that we know uh, what's going on and um, how it affects things and what we can do naturally in the future uh, to prevent more, more disasters like this. Uh, so it's really cool, uh, the stuff you're doing out there. Now, I understand you've got some uh, really cool animals to show us as well. I do. So the, the first is uh, something really special that came up in the net last night. Um, it's called a cookie cutter shark. And, and these sharks are uh, specialist feeders. Technically, they're parasites. 
So they will swim up to other large fish or even marine mammals, and they've got a mouth structure that will sit up flat against the larger fish, but then a mouth structure that will gouge out a round plug from the larger fish. And then the cookie cutter shark takes off, and the, the larger fish is maybe a little, little upset, but not really much worse for the wear. Um, you can look at marine mammals, and you can even look at things like great white sharks that have been hit by cookie cutter sharks, and the scar or the wound is, is um, very distinctive. So biologists can see that scar and say with a high degree of, of uh, certainty that that was, you know, a, the, the impact from a cookie cutter shark. And this guy's probably a third of a meter long. Uh, try to show you the whole body here. There's the tail. Um, but the business end of a cookie cutter shark is right here. That is the the portion that takes the plug out of the larger fish or marine mammal. Uh, you can find dolphins and porpoises with cookie cutter shark scars, even gray white sharks. So uh, it's, it's a really cool animal. If you look to, they've got these really beautiful blue green eyes. One other aspect of their biology that's really fun, they're bioluminescent sharks. So they glow in the dark. Um, their ventral surface glows in the dark in, in, as well. And, and what's really important is that is a system of counter illumination. And, and what happens if, if you think of predators looking up right where the twilight zone is and other animals could be silhouetted by the, the dim light coming down from the surface, that silhouette can really give away a potential prey item and make it dinner. So a lot of animals will produce light on their ventral surface shining down and that light matches the intensity of the light coming down from the surface of the ocean. And quite literally, the silhouette disappears and they can hide in plain sight from a from predator. So counter illumination is, is one reason why things glow in the dark uh, down in the depths. Now I have another uh, special animal here to show you. It's a big dragonfish. This is called a threadfin dragonfish. Uh, you can see the, the head there and you notice that it's got a, a, a barbel hanging off of its chin and it's got a, a, a bulb at the end of that barbel that glows in the dark. That is intrinsic bioluminescence or bioluminescence produced by the fish, not by a symbiotic bacteria living with the fish. And then if you look on the sides of this fish, you see rows of, of uh, little round dots and those are called photophores. Those are structures that glow in the dark. The arrangement of those photophores probably helped this species figure out um, same-sex individuals in the dark, and then rival uh, or uh, potential mates, opposite-sex individuals in the dark. you got to remember, in the dark, it's important to have some mechanism to, to recognize potential mates, potential rivals, and uh, bioluminescence would be a great way to do that in the arrangement of photophores on the sides of the fish. So in this one species, you actually have two different mechanisms for using bioluminescence. One is to at attract potential prey items uh, to within striking distance of the dragonfish. You can see the giant jaws and the big teeth there. Uh, these guys will eat just about anything that fits in their mouth that they can swallow. But then you also have this second bioluminescence mechanism that would potentially help this species to recognize uh, potential mates or potential rivals. I have one other specimen here for you. He's a fascinating animals this is uh this is really a treat for me the the cookie cutter shark was uh i've always been a shark fan i love everything but the cookie cutter shark is something i've i've never seen one outside of a book so this is fascinating stuff dante oh they're cool yeah i yeah, know this this was a wonderful uh, thing to discover in the nets this morning now, this is a viper fish polyotis sloni this is sloan's viper fish you can see they've just got these enormous jaws and these enormous teeth, they're pretty strong teeth. Um, one funny thing about uh, Coleotis, just like with the dragonfish, if you look at the side, you can see all those rows of dots. They've got photophores on their flanks as well. Um, they've got <clears throat> spots on their face that glow in the dark. But one funny thing about Coleotis, sometimes their eyes are a little bit too big for their stomach. Biologists have found dead viper fish floating on the surface with prey items stuck in their mouth that were too big for them to get down. It didn't end well for the viper fish and it didn't end well for the potential prey item. But, you know, the, these systems are not perfect. Sometimes they make mistakes and uh, sometimes that mistake will cost a viper fish its life. But 
This is another one of those great deep water predators. Um, one cool thing about viper fish, they move up and down in the water column daily with something that's known as the deep scattering layer. And the deep scattering layer is an assemblage of wildlife that lives down in the twilight zone or the dark zone by day. <clears throat> and then at night, it comes up to that whole assemblage, rises up in the water column to feed in the produ uh, productive surface waters. It's actually the largest migration of wildlife on Earth, and it happens every day, both directions. At dawn, they all go back down. So most people don't know about it. Uh, the Navy had uh, a lot of interest in it because ships and subs were getting false depth readings because sometimes the deep scattering layer is so thick, it looks like the bottom of the ocean on radar. So the Navy was really interested in being able to decipher the deep scattering layer from the true bottom depth of wherever that ship or sub happened to be. So there was a lot of early research funded by the Navy that helped us figure out what the deep scattering layer is all about. One other cool thing about the deep scattering layer, if you get a um, solar eclipse and, and the sun, the, the light starts to dim, that scattering layer will start coming up in the middle of the day. And as soon as the light comes back, they'll go back down. So it is a light mediated phenomenon. Um, but, but really cool, the reason that viper fish tie into that, they actually move with the deep scattering layer up in the evening and down at dawn. So they're feeding on components of that deep scattering layer and they're, they're one of the great predators of the, of the deaths. That's really, that, that's really cool. And what has always amazed me about that, uh, that process is, you know, your viper fish, they live at this, um, what is it, the bathyotrophic level, and they come up to the meso or mesotrophic level or something like that. But um, yeah, I kind of got my things. But the fact that the, uh, the different pressures of the water, anybody who has scuba dived understands that that we were not really built for being underwater, but we have to slow down about every 30 feet. And, and, you know, when we ascend back up and it's a very slow process, but these animals do this every night. And um, you would think for such a small animal that those, those changes in pressure and such would be, uh, would be devastating, but they're able to do that. You know, it's, it's, it's a very good point. There are a couple of things to, to mention about this. One thing that a lot of surface fish have is an, a swim bladder, an air bladder inside their body that is filled with a gas that helps them maintain neutral buoyancy. If you are a species moving from considerable depth to shallower water and back on a daily, that's really not beneficial. You're going to have a lot of trouble regulating that, that, that gas bubble inside your body. So a lot of these deep sea fishes simply don't have swim bladders and they hit neutral buoyancy using other mechanisms. Some of them will load their tissues up. Some deep sea species like uh, some prawns will load their tissues up with ammonia. Ammonia floats on water, so that helps them hit neutral buoyancy. <coughs> um, some sharks will do it with oils. So there's different things that physiologically tricks that you can do that'll make that process a little bit easier. The thing that, that I think a lot of the deep scattering layer will avoid they don't come up right to the surface. Uh, you know, you, you know how hot surface waters are during summertime in the Gulf of Mexico. It's practically a bathtub. It's really the temperature differences that will, will nail these guys. The, the last few meters of surface water, uh, especially during the summer, will cook these guys alive. If you think about it, where they come from down at, at three, four, five hundred meter depth, the water's very cold. Right, it's 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 above freezing, but it's very cold. So it's that temperature change that can can really get to them when they come up, say in a net like we have. Um, but there are a few species that that manage it, um, and then there's again the whole deep scattering layer. They don't come right up to the surface, but they do come up close enough to feed on the productive surface waters in general. That's really awesome stuff. I I really envy you for uh, being able to do a lot of everything that you, you get out there to do. Um, I'm convinced if I, if I lived forever, which I plan to so far, so good, but um, I could live forever and, and still not 
explore everything I wanted to on this planet. There's just so much going on that uh, I've always said you could you could spend a lifetime just studying in your own backyard. Uh, it's, it's such an amazing planet, and there's so much that we don't know. Um, but you're out there doing this important work, and that I mean, to me, I'm I'm jealous, but I'm also very thankful that we could uh, we could hook up with you via the technology and talk to you about this. Uh, another, what's it like to live on a research ship? You know, it's, it's a, it's, again, it's a real privilege to be out here. I'm, I'm with some of the world's top marine biologists. I learn things every day. My degree actually is not in marine biology. Um, during, during, a you know, side work, I actually study amphibians. So that's, that's more or less what, what I was trained to do. But I'm out here with, with these great marine biologists, and they, they let me tag along and, and help out. But the, the, the other point I want to make is that my leadership at San Antonio Zoo has been great in allowing me to participate in these kinds of projects yeah. because they're all conservation-based. Um, but to have leadership that, that recognizes the value of doing these kinds of things is really important. Um, but but more on to your question, what is, what is it like out here? Well, when it's calm, it's really nice. When it's not, it's not nice. Um, you know, on a, when, when the storms kick up out here, sometimes it can get bad enough where we really can't even deploy the equipment and we can't fish. Um, and we just have to wait it out. Uh, sometimes we'll move around systems or we'll move to different sampling sites to see if we can find a place with, with where the chop is not quite as bad. But it's, it's amazing out here. You know, we've got a, a great captain and a great crew. We've got a, a, a chef out here who keeps us well fed. Actually, uh, I gain weight on these trips. I've got to be careful. The food is that good. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's kind of like living in an apartment. You know, you're, you're around a whole bunch of people 24-7, but everybody's got a mission and they, they've got, you know, a, a common goal. And uh, we all work as a team. It's, it's really nice. It's fun to be part of. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and I just wanted to touch on, and I think that this is very important for everyone watching to know, is that, uh, you know, Dante is based out of the San Antonio Zoo, which is one of the top uh, zoos in the, in, in the world. And they do amazing amount of research and conservation work at the San Antonio Zoo. Uh, incredible bunch of people out there. Uh, some of them are among my dearest friends. But the conservation programs that are going on, it's not just deep sea uh, fishes. You guys are doing work with cave fish. You're doing work with salamanders. You're doing work with uh, the horned lizards uh, right here in Texas. So there's an amazing amount of things that you guys are involved with that um, over the last year, I think, is uh, with, with COVID and with everybody staying home and being shut in, uh, it's been really hard for a lot of these uh, researchers and biologists to uh, to have the funding that they need to to continue this research. So at the very end of this, I'm going to put up a uh, some information of how you can donate and how you can help support the programs going on at the San Antonio Zoo, because this is very important stuff. Uh, just because we are shut in doesn't mean that that conservation and research stops. It's, it's a process that we have to uh, continue with all the time in order to make progress and, and preserve the biodiversity on this planet and then preserve ourselves on this planet. So I think that's very important. So I urge everybody to stick around and take note of that and do what you can to help out with these programs. Yeah, Doug, thank you so much. We do, we work in the Peruvian Amazon with indigenous communities. Uh, helping them uh, retain stands of rainforest on their traditional lands. Uh, we work with uh, Chilean biologists and help set up conservation breeding labs uh, for critically endangered amphibians. We work with biologists from the Chinese Academy of Sciences on cave fish in South China. Uh, we work with Japanese biologists up in the mountains, um, working to conserve Japanese giant salamanders. And then, like you said, we've got a ton of work in the United States. We're working with Texas horned lizards, and we're working with reticulate flatwood salamanders. We work with uh, great partners at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and all kinds of state wildlife agencies. We do a lot of cave work in, in about nine different states. 
Um, so we're, we're pretty active. Um, it's all, as you said, though, it's all research grant funded or private donation funded. And um, we really rely on that to keep going. Uh, wow, you've been a busy guy since I last saw you. You guys, you guys have, I'm, I'm always amazed to, to keep up with what you've got going on out there. And I've done conservation work in the past and, uh, and it, it's pretty involved. And I think what a lot of people don't realize with conservation too, is that um, it's just as much about working with people and working with communities as it is with the animals. As a matter of fact, the animals kind of take a backseat of some of the conservation work that we have to do. Um, so it's just, it's amazing what you guys have already accomplished, what you're accomplishing now and just the, um, what you guys are going to do in the future. And it's always got me glued to the screen of what's going on out there in San Antonio, uh, because it's amazing stuff. You know, I, I have a really good team that I get to work with at San Antonio Zoo that works with me in my department of conservation research. Any successes that we've had are entirely attributable to them and not me. I'm, I'm just sort of head organizer. I, I, you know, wave flags and try to find money and, and try to find the things that they need. But really, all credit goes to, to the team that I get to work with. And any successes that we've had, it's on their shoulders, not mine. If your uh, followers and listeners would like more information on the project, on this project, the website is deependconsortium.org. All one word, deependconsortium.org. You're going to be out uh, at sea for how much longer? Uh, we're out for another week or so. So, Dante, let me let you get back at it. And uh, again, thank you for joining us today.